Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise. We're blessed to have you zoom in with us. We acknowledge God's favor and express our gratitude to our minister, Dr. Lane, and our leadership for their support and sponsorship. The contributions and participation of our speakers, technical staff, and program facilitators are greatly appreciated and valued. Our sisters in Christ will be referencing women in positions like us, acknowledging their roles and responsibilities, encompassing the challenges they present. Our goal is to encourage all of you to keep hanging on to hope, which is our 2021 congregational theme. Welcome. Let us pray. Father God, we know if it had not been for you on our side, where would we be? We're so thankful right now. And so I start this prayer in the spirit of thanksgiving, thanking you, even as we think and reflect back on last year around this time of our ladies program, Lord, our, our message was strength for the struggle. And we didn't even know the struggle that 2020 might bring. Even though you brought us through many struggles, many, many times before, Lord God, nothing but you and nobody but you could have prepared us. And now, Lord, we stand before you here in 2021 after many loss many sick times, many times when we did not know what the next day would bring, what the next hour would even bring, Lord. We stand thanking you. We also stand, Lord God, hanging on to hope in 2021 and forward, Lord. I thank you for this day that you have brought our sisters together in this virtual way. We thank you that your word still spreads, even if we're not in a building together, Lord God, that we're able to come together and still hear a word from you. I pray for every lady that will be represented on this line today as they bring a word from you, as they share in their experiences. I pray for the other ladies who are listening in, who are representing in each of their congregations and just wanting to hear a word and wanting to collectively connect with one another. Because maybe there's a lady here that has just a little bit of hope, Lord God. And there's another one of us that has a lot of hope. Lord, collectively together, we know that even faith the size of a mustard seed, that you have blessed it and you will bless us through it. Thank you so much, Lord God. I'm praying for strength for everyone, even those, and especially those who are visiting with us on this line today, Lord God. We pray a special prayer over them and just ask that you just keep us all. Give us that fresh word and we'll be ever so grateful. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings, sisters. My name is Sister Natalie Smith. I bring you greetings from the Kingsley Terrace Church of Christ here in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I am by way of Texas, though. <laughs> um, I do just want to say um, God is so good, and I'm so thankful to be able to be a part of um, today's program. I pray that the songs that we do sing um, blesses you um, this morning, and just sing along as we go. Trials dark on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. But he guides us with his eyes, and we'll follow till we die. We will understand it better by and by. 
singing by yen by oh when the morning comes and all the saints of God are gathering home and we will tell the story how we overcome we will understand it better by and by temptations hidden snares often take us unaware and our hearts are made to bleed for each thoughtless word or deed and we wonder why the test when we try to do our best we will understand it better by by singing by yeah by oh when the morning comes and all the saints of god are gathering home and we will tell the story how we overcome and we'll understand it better by and by singing by yeah by oh when the morning comes and all the saints of God are gathering home and we will tell the story how we overcome and we'll understand it better by and by. Good morning, saints. This is Priscilla Russell from the Kingsley Terrace Church of Christ in Indianapolis. And we have started off with some wonderful singing and all the wonderful praise from Sister Lane and Sister Nickerson and Natalie. Thank you so much. We are so excited about today. Hanging on to hope in 2021. We had to hang on to hope in 2020. And I, I can understand where Sister Nickerson was talking about when she was, they were looking for strength for the struggle. And Natalie, that was a perfect sum, understanding it better by and by. Next on our program, we'll have a scripture by Sister Brianna Wooten. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everybody here. Um, today's scripture reading will be from Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses 19 and 20. Once again, that is Hebrews, the sixth chapter, verses 19 and 20. And I'll be reading the NIV version. Okay. And it reads, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Thank you, be blessed. All right, thank you, Brianna. So next on our program, we're going to have four speakers from the Southern Hills Church of Christ congregation. The first speaker will be Sister Kim Brown, and she'll be talking about a single mother hanging on to hope, Hagar. And our next speaker will be Sister Sharon Martin, and she'll be talking about a wife hanging on to hope. Who was Ruth? And thirdly, we will have Sister Rosie Smith giving us a lesson about a widow hanging on to hope, Zarephath. And then Sister Deborah Neely will come to us 
and she will come talking and sharing with us a single woman hanging on the hope, Miriam. And in the meantime, we're going to have some great singing by Sister Natalie in between. And now we'll let Sister Natalie go ahead and sing some wonderful songs and get us in the spirit. Thank you. Time is filled with swift transition. Oh, not on earth and who can stand? And it build your hopes on things eternal and a hope. To God's unchanging hand, well, trust in Him who will not leave you. Whatsoever years may bring, when, when your earthly friends forsake. Closely to him cling, everybody ought to hold to his hand. Hold on to my God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold hang to his God's unchanging hand, and you ought to build your hopes on things deep. Turn all everybody ought to hold to God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold to his hand. Hold on to my God's unchanging hand. Everybody ought to hold to his hand, to my God's unchanging hand. You ought to build your hopes on things eternal. Everybody ought to hold to God's unchanging hand. Hello, I'm going to tell you the story of Hagar, who was a woman in the Bible. She was very many things. She was a handmaiden, she was a concubine, and she was also a single mother. Now, we're going to look at who she actually was. She being a handmaiden in the house of Abram was given over by her mistress, Sarah to Abram because they couldn't conceive. You see, Sarah was barren and they were very old. They were elderly and they had no heirs. Because they didn't have an heir, she felt like it was necessary in order to make one and to produce that heir for her husband. And she would find that in her house. So they took this Egyptian concubine in her house in order to be able to produce that heir now, Sarah was barren, so she couldn't have any children. And tensions arose between the two. Once Hagar realized that that's what, her, what she was being asked to do, she ran away. She fleed. The Bible tells us that God met her and spoke to her and asked her, why are you running? She had no answer. All she knew was that she was running, but she didn't know why. You see, our steps are ordered by God, and he knew why. Let's take a look and see why she had to go and do what she did. Now, the story of Hagar demonstrates that the survival is possible, even under the harshest conditions. Remember, she was all of these things. She was a concubine. She was an Egyptian handmaiden, but she was also a single mother. 
And being given by her mistress to her husband to conceive is something that she hadn't anticipated. You see, she didn't know where her steps were going. And when she ran away, God instructed her to go back. And we can find that in Genesis 16, verse 8, where he says, where have you come from? And where are you going? She had no answer to the question at hand. All that she knew was that God instructed her to go back. And that, you know, fleeing was not something that she should do. It's not about the situation at the moment. They reflect, the situations reflect her past and her future. And what was her answer to God when he instructed her to go back? Well, she did as commanded. You know, God commanded Hagar to return, but she was uncertain, as many of us are, when you are a single parent, about what was going to happen. But she hadn't made it to being a single parent yet. She knew what she was being asked to do. She was being asked to produce an heir. But she didn't know anything past that. The question is at hand, where are you going? Do you know your path? She didn't know her path. All she knew was that she was going where God instructed her to go. Go back. Now, our steps are unknown, but God has a plan. The plan for Hagar was that she would bear a child to Abram, but that child wouldn't be the heir. But he would be blessed. Not as the heir of Abram, but he would still be blessed. And through her, she was as well. If you don't know where you're going, God can answer that question for you. He put her on the path. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. You ladies. I am Sharon Martin from the Southern Hills Church of Christ. My topic about for the next few minutes will be hanging on to hope as a wife. My text reference is the book of Ruth. Most of us are familiar with the story of Ruth and her life that she had. But let's do a quick overview of that book. Naomi and her husband and two sons left Bethlehem because of a famine to go live in the land of Moab. After a while, 
Naomi's husband, died. Her two sons married Moabite women, and after about 10 years, the two sons died. It was at this time, I'm sure that Naomi was at her end of her rope, and she decided that it was time for her to go back to Bethlehem. Things had picked up and were better then. So she left. She and Ruth went back to Bethlehem. It was there in Bethlehem where Ruth met Boaz. They were married, and they had a son. That's the gist of the book. It's four chapters. I encourage you to read it. Well, while preparing for this topic, the question came to my mind was, how does Ruth hang on to hope as a wife? Even though the book of Ruth tells us mostly about Ruth's life, our first look at what a wife can or cannot be is seen with Naomi and her faithfulness to her husband and two sons. Her willingness to follow her husband to Moab for a better life. Naomi was hanging on to hope. As a wife, we hang on to hope when it seems as if we are at the end of our rope. Like I said, Naomi must have felt that way when her husband died. Ruth also must have felt that way after 10 years her husband died. Then, her mother-in-law makes the announcement that she's returning to her homeland of Bethlehem. Ruth was hanging on to hope when she followed her mother-in-law back to Bethlehem. When hanging on to hope as a wife, you are God-fearing. When Ruth decided to follow her mother-in-law Naomi back to Bethlehem, she also decided that Naomi's God would be her God. We see that in Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, and it reads, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you, for wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts us apart from us. Therefore, she was hanging on to hope that God would provide for them. As a wife, you are trustworthy. Ruth showed us that by staying with Naomi, even when Oprah left to return to her mother's house. Also, by working in the fields to glean and gather grain among the reapers, Ruth 2, 1 through 6. As a wife, hanging on to hope, We strive to be dependable and a hard worker. Ruth was both. We see that in Ruth 2, 7 through 9. When the servant in charge of the field was asked by Boaz, who was she? And his reply was, well, that is the Moabite woman that came back with Naomi. But he didn't stop there. He continued his answer by saying, She came and asked if she could work the field, and she continued from morning until night, though she rested a little in the house. When hanging on to hope as a wife, you are strong, dignified, wise, and knowledgeable. We can read this about Ruth in chapters 2, verses 10 through 23. Ruth had an inner beauty, and she was respectful, as we read in chapters 3 and 4. We learn that Ruth not only respected Naomi, but respected the customs and ways of her people. She now called her own. As we strive to hold on to hope as a wife, like Ruth, we know that there will be days that we will have devastating things to come into our life. But with God, we can hold on to hope. When we are God-fearing and holding on to God's unchanging hand, we will be able to face those devastating times 
with a little bit of confidence knowing that God is holding us in his arm. As we strive to hold on to hope as the wife, and we are trustworthy, dependable, hardworking, strong, dignified, wise, and knowledgeable, just like Ruth, we will be able to face the work that must be done. We can get up on the mornings when we feel that we can't. We can be able to, people could be able to say and look at us and speak in good terms of concerning us when we are walking in a dignified way. We can go to a different city, state, or country and know that God is with us. As we hold on to hope today and the days going forward, like Ruth, let us let our inner beauty shine. So our Boaz will see us and strive to do whatever it takes to make sure to keep us as his root. As I close, I would like to leave a thought that I've been wrestling with, uh, more of a question. And that question is, if he's my Boaz, am I his root? Thank you. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I more and more, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace, oh, for grace, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him. Precious Jesus, my Savior and my friend, and I know that God is with me. He'll be with me till the end. I'm calling on Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him and how I prove him o'er and o'er. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, pray. Just Jesus and oh for grace, oh sing oh for grace, oh sing oh for grace, only God's grace, oh for grace, thank him for his grace. God's grace, it was God's amazing grace, oh, for grace, sing with me, sing, oh, for grace, to trust 
him more. I would just like to say uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone. And today's uh, topic is, um, we're gonna be talking about the widow hanging on uh, to hope. Uh, and I want to admit, uh, first of all, I'm not a widow, praise the Lord. But I have witnessed uh, several women who are widows and the things that widows go through. But we're gonna talk about the widow uh, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17, verse 10 through 24. Now, I'm not going to read all the scriptures because um, I'm not going to take you all can take time to do that at a later time. But um, I'm going to introduce you to the, the characters uh, in this particular setting. Uh, first of all, they're in uh, Zarephath and they have a widow there and she has a son. And we also have Elijah who is going to uh, stand by this widow uh, along with God. And we know that God is in everything. But we want to um, look at the characteristics of this particular widow. Now, we don't have a name for her, uh, but we knew that she was a Jewish woman and uh, she was a Gentile uh, and she was very poor and people ignored her and she has a son. But God sent uh, his prophet Elijah to help this widow. We have to acknowledge that in their fact that um, they were in a drought. And um, Elijah has to seek this widow in order to help her. And he said, uh, he let her know that he didn't, uh, what he came for, he came to, to help her. But the widow thought that the little food that she had, which was flour and oil, and after she um, used up her flour and oil, that her and her son would die. But Elijah said, uh, go on, but he wanted her the first to make her uh, make a small cake. But we have to realize that uh, Elijah had instruments. He had the raven, he had the brook, and he had, and he finally got the widow. So he wanted her to go on and use what she had. But the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, said that flour and oil would not be used up until the Lord uh, sent rain. Now the widow did what Elijah said. Um, there was food every day for Elijah and for the son and for the widow. But when we look at this story, um, and this is the very interesting part, um, is the son of this widow dies. And she thinks that that is, uh, that she is being punished for a sin that she done long time ago. And sometimes today we think about that, that when we when we start going through tragedies and trials and tribulations, we think that God is punishing us for something that we uh, have done. But um, Elijah did something uh, for the widow. He, he took the son and into the upper room and he prayed and prayed to God three times and he said, oh Lord, my God, have you placed a tragedy to this widow? The Lord heard Elijah's prayer and he brought life back to that son. The son had stopped breathing and, and so the widow thinking, just like we think when a person stopped breathing, it's over. But uh, the Lord brought uh, life to him. Uh, and she was so excited about this and she began to give her testimony. She said, Elijah said, look, he is alive. And of course the widow could not believe that. But if you look down to verse 24, she gives a testimony. She said, now I know you are a man of God and the word is truth. And in today's world, we need to be uh, thankful for what we have and do what God wants us to do. And we have to be obedient to receive a blessing. We have to honor him to receive a blessing. And we have to have faith in him to receive a blessing. Um, losing a child is, um, my understanding of that and, and being a widow is not uh, something easy to deal with. Widows deal with loneliness. Uh, widows deal with um, 
rearing uh, small children or either adult children who may have uh, problems in their life and they only have uh, the mother to depend on. Um, I know uh, of several cases where women uh, have to carry the whole load uh, in the family because they are a widow and the husband has gone on. Now it's a difference um, sometimes when you have adult children and uh, you become a widow and God will take those adult children and he can leave the widow alone. But we know that God will supply that widow's every need because that's what he did in this particular story. When you look back, um, he put Elijah in her life, not to date her, but to help her when this, when this son was gonna stop breathing. But the widow had some things she needed to do for God. She had to be obedient to him. She had to uh, supply food for Elijah. And she was able to get food for herself as well as for her son. She did that. Then she, she was blessed because she did what God wanted her to do. She had no idea. She knew her son was sick, but she had no idea. It doesn't say when uh, the Lord would take her son. But when he got sick and, and Elijah stepped up and his prayers went up, God answered those prayers. Uh, this is a very interesting lesson. Like I said, I'm not I'm not a widow, but I have witnessed some things widows go through. When they become lonely, sometimes they seek um, attention from uh, other people uh, because there are needs that widows uh, are standing in need of, and it's it's um, it's like a financial situation come uh, when you become a widow because one finance has stopped. And you just depending on the one. You have to find a way to, to take care of everything. But God supplies every time. When we obey him, he supplies everything for us. As also we look into the story, we don't know the name of the son. But you know he was ill. And some widows have children that are ill um, before she become a widow. And after she's a widow, uh, becomes a widow, she still's got that son that's ill or that daughter that's ill and she has to take care of. So a widow takes on a lot of responsibility and I have a lot of respect for them. But one thing, uh, all the widows that I know um, are the ones that lean on God. They always say, but God, but God, but God, but God. And what they're saying is, but God is taking care of them. Very interesting story. Um, I learned a lot from it. Um, uh, I don't know the widow's name, they didn't give a name for her but we know that she was the widow in Zarephath. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lord. And we're singing thank, thank you, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we thank Thank you, thank you, Lord. And I just want to thank you, Lord. You have been, been so, been so good. Oh, Lord, you have been, been so good oh lord you have been been so 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 good and i want to say i just want to thank you lord you saved you saved our souls oh lord you saved saved our souls oh lord you have saved saved our saved our soul and i just want to thank you lord
Lord, you made, made a way. Oh, Lord, you made, made a, made a way. Oh, Lord, you have made, made a, made a way. And I just want to thank you, Lord. Introduction of Miriam by way of scripture. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we find that Miriam is smart, resourceful, a loyal protector, mentor, and a faithful spiritual leader. She is also a challenger of Moses. Miriam's role in scripture, the protector, in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, when Moses' mother hid him in a basket floating along the Nile, she sent Moses' older sister Miriam to watch over him. When Egypt's princes discovered the infant, Miriam quick-wittedly volunteered to find the princess a nurse and called her own mother. Miriam's resourcefulness made her a key figure in shaping Moses' future and subsequently that of the nation of Israel. Miriam as the prophetess in Exodus chapter 15 verses 20-21 we find that Miriam, like Moses, had the prophetic gift and calling. After God parted the Red Sea for his people and wiped out the Egyptian army, Miriam's role in the redeemed community became more evident. The Lord's victory over the Egyptians at the Red Sea lifted the hearts of the Israelites in praise. Miriam led all of the women to praise God for his victory. Their songs and their dances express the joy and the wonder of the entire community. We find that Miriam, the unhappy challenger of Moses in Numbers 12 verses 1 through 3, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses after leaving Sinai. The dispute it began with the criticisms of Moses for his marriage to an Ethiopian woman. This was not the real problem, but rather an attempt to arouse support by appealing to a people's prejudice. The real thing that bothered Miriam was that others did not perceive her as being as important as Moses. The gifts the two had the privileges each as spiritual leaders enjoyed somehow were not enough. Miriam desperately wanted to be viewed by all as someone on par with Moses and not subordinate to him. The resolution we find in Numbers chapter 12, verses 4 through 8, the attitudes of Miriam and Aaron were disruptive and if they persisted, they were sure to undermine Moses' authority. So God intervened, so God intervened and called the three to him and made his will clear. God has chosen Moses as the leader. Miriam and Aaron had important ministries of their own. The outcome we find in Numbers chapter 12, verses 9 through 16, their challenge to Moses aroused God's anger. And when the two had been rebuked, Miriam suddenly became leprous. Some felt that it was not fair that Aaron was not punished as well. Moses prayed for his sister and God did remove the leprosy. In seven days, God fully restored her, and she continued to serve God and her people as a prophetess and a worship leader. In summary, <clears throat> Miriam is an example for today. 
Miriam's role as a prophetess illustrates that God speaks to the whole community of faith through women as well as men. Miriam's faults teaches us as her gifts. When she criticized Moses, she dishonored God and the man with whom he had the most intimate relationship. People in a position of leadership have an extra responsibility to honor God. God expects those he puts in a leadership position to humble themselves and to honor him. Miriam reminds us that jealousy and pride stands in the way of our fellowship with God. They also keep God from using us to minister to others. And finally, we are to rejoice in the gifts God gives us and use them enthusiastically. Comparing ourselves to others is dangerous and wrong. We can fulfill, we can find fulfillment in serving where we are. We need not feel demeaned if we do not have gifts or positions of, of that others enjoy. All right. We had four wonderful ladies. Ms. Brown. So you telling me if I don't know where I am, that God can correct, he can correct my path. He can send me where I need to go. I appreciate that. And then Sister Martin, you says, if he's my Boaz, am I his Ruth? That is fantastic. Then Sister Smith, so that, that Zarephath, her son, died and God supplied everything. So that's what we have to remember. We just got to go back to God. Then our fourth speaker, Sister Neely, he said, rejoice in the gifts that God gives us. Thank you so much. And thank you ladies for your presentations and all that you're doing for us today. It's outstanding. I need some hands uh, uh, down there in the little detail place. There we go, there we go. Cause this, I learned a lot today. Every time you have some of these things, you learn something else that you need to be doing. Amen. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. So next, we're going to we're going to have a little time at the end for you guys to if you got some comments at the end of everything, we'll take care of you because it was really some great things said today. And I appreciate those ladies for putting those lessons together and always so encouraging. And next, we're going to have a scripture from Sister Sheila Williams with Kingsley Terrace. Thank you, Sister Priscilla. Our scripture reading for our keynote speaker comes from Romans, the 15th chapter and the 13th verse. Again, it comes from Romans 15, chapter 13 and Romans. And it says, and I'm reading from the Living Bible. So I pray for you Gentiles that God who gives you hope will keep you happy and full of peace as you believe in him. I pray that God will help you overflow with hope in him through the Holy Spirit's power that is within you. All right. Okay, Sister Sheila, thank you. You know, that's my buddy, guys. <laughs> so next we're gonna have our keynote speaker. And of course, Sister Natalie is going to give us a song and we'll get her introduction. However, I just want to say that uh, Sister, Huff, Sister Hubbard, she keeps us encouraged. She always makes sure that, that uh, we're on task. And she's, she's one of those ladies that use the word voluntold. Have you guys heard that? It's not, it's not, it's like you go to volunteer, but she just voluntolds you like, Okay, we know your we know what you can do, so I'm gonna volunteer. So I'm like, okay, did I volunteer for that? Said so, no, she just made sure. She said, no, we're not taking no for an answer, young ladies. We're gonna take care of this. 
So we're going to go to the next part of our session that we just thank you. I, I have to say thank you because it's so wonderful to see all these faces on here. I was from all over the country, not just local, encouraging at Southern Hills, Church of Christ, just doing wonderful things for them. So next, we're going to have a song by Sister Natalie, and we'll have the introduction of the speaker. And the next wonderful voice after that will be our own Sister Laura Hubbard. My God is awesome. He can move mountains. Keep me in the valley. Hide me from the rain. My God is awesome. Heals me when I'm broken. Strength where I've been weak and forever he will reign. My God is awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, oh awesome. Oh, awesome. My God is awesome. Savior of the whole world. Giver of salvation. By his stripes, I am healed. My God is awesome. Today I am forgiven. Grace is why I'm living. Praise his holy name. My God is awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. My God is awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. Oh, awesome. He is mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty. He's mighty, my God is awesome, oh, awesome. He is holy, he's holy, he's holy, he is holy, he is awesome, oh, awesome. He's a healer, a healer. A healer, a healer, my God is awesome, oh, awesome. My God is awesome, oh, awesome, oh, awesome, oh, awesome. My God is awesome. Well, hello there, ladies. I'm Trifina Jenkins coming to you from Shreveport, Louisiana, by way of Kingsley Terrace Church of Christ in Indianapolis, Indiana, where Stanley J. Hubbard is the pastor there. And I have been honored to introduce to you your next speaker. But before I go into the full introduction, I gotta give you a disclaimer because a few things are gonna happen when she comes out onto the stage. And I don't wanna say you weren't warned. So you gotta buckle in tight because one of the things she's gonna do is she's gonna make you get real with yourself and real with where you are and where you need to be. Then she's going to really challenge you to evaluate your relationship with God and, and how that might need to look. Then she's going to push you just a little bit to make some changes that would improve your spiritual walk with God. So all these things are great things and necessary, but sometimes a little uncomfortable. So now you've been warned. And the reason why I know for sure that these things are probably going to happen is because I was raised by her. So if you haven't figured it out yet, your next speaker is Laura Hubbard. 
Laura Hubbard has been a Christian for over 44 years. Uh, she is a native of Beaumont, Texas, and she currently worships at Kingsley Terrace Church of Christ, where her husband, Stanley Hubbard, is the pastor. Uh, her and, and Pastor Hubbard have been married for 41 years, have three children and eight grandchildren. And I'm not going to read her whole resume because it will be too long, but I will highlight some things I think are very important to speak to her ministries. Um, one is that she has been a life coach providing spiritual counseling to uh, several women and, and teenage girls, adolescent girls over the years. Uh, she's also an author. She has written the book Messed Up Sisterhood and Sleepwalking to Hell, as well as has co-authored uh, a, a couple's workbook called Second Breath for Couples with her husband. And she has also, pre-COVID, <laughs> traveled all around the world um, providing workshops that address pertinent issues um, that affect how us as, as women uh, kind of make this journey through life um, and incorporating God. But more importantly, one of the things that I've seen from her over the years uh, that speaks to her ministry is, is her, her drive to address the sisterhood. Sometimes as women, we are harder on ourselves and each other than anyone else. And, and because of this, I've, I've seen her taken to the sisterhood as a ministry and trying to encourage us to be better to ourselves, better to each other and supportive uh, to make this role just a little bit easier. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you guys, my mama, Sister Laura Hubbard. All right, are we there? Can you see me? Can you hear me? All right. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. I, I want to thank uh, my beautiful daughter, Trifina, for, for that wonderful introduction of me. She, uh, she did an excellent job and she's the joy of my life. She has exceeded every expectation that her father and I have ever had of her, for her. And, and I'm just as happy as peacocks and just proud that she is my daughter. Thank you, baby. To uh, Sister Lane and to the Southern Hills uh, sisters, I just want to thank you for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful virtual event. Ladies, isn't this wonderful? Uh, Southern Hills has made a way to connect us all in one place on today. And we have Southern Hills to thank for that. So thank you, thank you for bringing us all together. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be with you today and just to share just a few of the nuggets that I have gleaned from my study in the word of God. Uh, hanging on to hope in 2021. Mm -mm -mm. This, this study blessed me. I'm telling you, I got mine. And I hope and I pray that somebody on this line get theirs. I pray all of you get yours. You know, because what I've learned through my study on this topic is when all you have left is God, you have all you need to hang on to. And if you get nothing else from this lesson, let that be your takeaway. Amen. Let that be your takeaway because sisters, if there was ever a time that, that we needed to hang on to hope, it's now. Amen. Uh, hold on. It is not, hold on. Something is not going on. Hold on. It won't let me go to the next slide. Uh, mm -mm -mm. Natalie, it won't. I can't get the full screen. I'm sorry. Hold on. Um, since I hit play, it should work on your play. There it is. Is that better, ladies? 
thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> so, so hanging on to hope in 2021. I, 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 I tell you, we all need hope, don't we? We all need hope. The singles that feel that she is at the end of her rope in a broken relationship need hope. Wives that feel completely out of sync and disconnected from their husbands, they need hope too. Widows that, that feel the emptiness and the loneliness more and more each and every day, they need hope. Single mothers, like the one we heard about today, the, uh, mothers that are out there that are frustrated with the challenges of taking care of their children all by themselves need hope. The divorced that's afraid of being single again need hope. Our teen girls that's walking down a dark path in their lives, oh Lord, we know they need hope. The sister that received a bad medical report from the doctor and is experiencing the emotions of uncertainty need hope. We all need hope. And uh, uh, the scripture says that hope is an anchor for our souls. And uh, you see what keeps your soul anchored in the right place sisters, and empowers you to overcome the obstacles in your life when you're going through a trial and empowers you to reach your dreams hangs on to hope. That means no matter what you're going through, no matter, no matter how uh, troubling the times and the storms become, no matter how difficult life is, no matter how long it's taken, you know that God is still on the throne and that he, that he plans good for your life and that, and that he's bigger than any challenge that you can ever have. And ultimately, you know that he's got you. Amen. Amen. So, 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 when, so when you receive a, a, a bad medical report, a lot, of, a lot of people would get distressed and, and depressed and, and get nervous about it, but not you. Because you're hanging on to hope. When, when, when you go through a loss or a disappointment, and your emotions are pulling you uh, towards discouragement, towards bitterness, and something keeps holding you back. You can't explain it, but deep down inside your spirit, you hear a voice saying, everything's going to be all right. That's you holding on to hope. You, you see, when your hope is anchored in God, he will make things happen that you could never make happen. Hope. Paul says in Romans chapter five and verse five, that hope doesn't disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he has given us hope. We can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't smell it, but it's there. It's there leading us through the choices we make through our situations, through our mistakes, our choices, our successes, our failures, and our fears. Hope is always there, carving a way where there is no way. You see, hope. <laughs> In Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, Paul said that we have uh, hope, the God of hope. And the God of hope fills you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may what? Overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, sisters, in order for you to hang on to something or someone, you have to trust it. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So, so, so before you can hang on to the hope you have in God, you have to put your trust in him first. Because sisters, if you're trusting in the wrong thing, 
He can't fill you with joy and peace and overflow you with hope. Hmm. And I don't, I don't know about you, but sisters, I need an overflowing hope to hang on to as I'm going into a new season in my life and with the challenges of my mother growing older. I think we all can use some overflowing hope to hang on to. Amen and amen. I, 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 want, you, I want you to notice that Paul begins this text with may the God of hope fill you. You know what I, what I, what I learned through my research on this word uh, uh, hope is that it means to have an earnest expectation. It's when you are able to securely put your trust in something or someone and keep it there. <laughs> and there it is. God promised us that, that he will be our hope, that no matter what is going on through our lives, he will be our hope. And since hope means an earnest expectation, we can place our expectations in him. We can trust him with the direction of our life. We can trust him in the circumstances we are in. And as you trust him with your relationships, with your finances, and with your health, God will overflow you with hope. He will give you the strength to hang on to him, and he will fill you with all you need to get through whatever it is you are going through. Amen. Hope. There is no way I can talk to you about hope without talking about faith. Amen, somebody. There's just no way. Because the twins, hope and faith, are inseparable. And together, they give us the power to hang on to him with an unshakable confidence in him. And when the storm comes, sisters, and they're coming if they haven't already, you will not be moved if you're hanging on to him. Amen. Look, look, look at what the Hebrew writer said here on the screen about faith in Hebrews 11 and 1. He says that, that, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, right? So you see the writer, the writer is not really defining what faith is. He's showing us what faith does. You see, faith provides the support for what you're hoping for. It is the substance. Faith looks to the future for when hope will become reality and waits patiently for when God's promises will be fulfilled. Oh, someone has said that, that faith is the bridge between where I am in my life and the place where God is taking me. And sometimes when you're hanging on to, to your hope in God, sisters, you, you may not even know where you're going. You may not even understand what's going on in your life. And when you're going through that life storm and your faith is being tested, that's not the time to throw in the towel and quit because it is, it is, in, doing those, it is in doing those times and doing those moments that God is taking all of that. He's taking your pain. He's taking your brokenness. He's taking your flaws and your imperfections. And he takes all of it to accomplish his perfect plan to fulfill his purpose. It's called spiritual development. <laughs> oh no. And so I searched, I, I searched the scriptures for a biblical character that hung on to hope through her faith in God. And I found Sarah. I think one of our sisters spoke about Sarah earlier. I found her. So let's talk about Sarah. She was mentioned more times in scripture than any other woman, even Mary, the mother of Jesus. She is the first woman mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith hall of fame. And God uses her as an example for us to follow today in 1 Peter 3 and chapter 6. 
So, so if we want to be a model of someone hanging on to faith through our hope, like Sarah, we really owe it to ourselves to find out what she was like. Amen. Was she perfect? Did she make poor decisions? How was she like us and how can we be like her? And more importantly, how was Sarah able to anchor her hope in the Lord? Oh, Lord, help somebody today. When I, when I read her life story, I noticed three powerful facts about Sarah and faith. First, it is not faith until you put it to practice. Mm. Second, faith is a spiritual growth process. And third, we are anchored to hope through our faith. You see, it, it is not faith until you put it to practice. You see, what I have discovered in life, sisters, is God, he will take our brokenness, right? And he will use our brokenness. And he will use a broken person like you and me to rescue broken people like you and me. But you have to put in the work. It's not going to come by osmosis. You can't keep it within you. You have to exercise your faith. Paul said in Philippians chapter two, verses 11 and 12, that's one of my very favorite chapters. He said, he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. And there it is, sisters. The Lord did not bless us to break free from the storms in our lives so that we could keep them to ourselves. No, he wants us to use those victories from our brokenness and work them into the lives of others going down a path that we have already defeated. You see, God takes everything in your life. He doesn't waste anything. He takes your pain, he takes your discouragement, and he takes your worry, and he will use it to accomplish his plan through you. Amen. And he wants you, he wants me to be patiently hanging on to his perfect plan and to not hurry ahead of him and create a mess. Oh, somebody didn't hear that. He wants us to wait patiently because God never executes his plan through us all at once. Just step by step because he wants us to walk by faith and not by sight. Sarah had to learn that lesson. She had to learn that. She, she had to travel down a pathway that she didn't always understand. Are you traveling down that pathway today? She had to seek goals that were beyond her earthly sight. You see, 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 faith is not connected to what you can see, feel, and touch. No, she had to learn how to travel into an unknown future and into a kingdom that was not of this world. She had to learn that lesson. And it was on her journey to becoming a model of faith that she was transformed from a state of brokenness and selfishness to a state of wholeness and usefulness in God's kingdom. And just like God raised up Sarah to act in a particular time in history for his purpose, he can raise us to be models of faith and hope in our day. And he can use us. He can use us to make a difference. He can use us to make a difference in, uh, in the sister's lives that's, that's going down a dark path. In the teenager's life that's at a fork in the road. In the widow life, who is lonely in, in, in the divorced woman's life, who is, who is struggling be, to, be, to being single again. He can use our hope to strengthen someone else's hope, but you have to exercise your faith and put it to practice. It is not faith until you put it to practice. And then faith, is a spiritual growth process. In, in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, Peter says, 
grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm. At some point in our lives, sisters, we have to stop acting like infants in our faith walk and start drinking and stop drinking milk and stop uh, and stop eating on on the little on the little vegetables. We have to start eating some meat because faith is a journey of growth and development and becoming all that God is calling us to be. Faith, you see, involves change. It involves movement and loss, and it involves gain. Oh, come on, help somebody, Lord. You see, faith is a step-by-step, moment-by-moment, choice-by-choice, and day-by-day process of responding to and obeying God's constant initiatives. It's a life long journey that occurs as you study his word and as you apply his word to your life because the bible says that 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 scripture that 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 the bible says that 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 god is uh useful the word of god is useful for teaching for rebuking for correcting and training in righteousness so that we may be thoroughly equipped for what every good work. Faith is a spiritual growth process. I, I'm sure that Sarah had no idea that her deepest pain would be a launching pad for her greatest calling in life. Think about that. Sarah, Sarah, the wife of the great patriarch, Abraham. Mm. When, when you hear her name, we tend to think of her with a certain degree of dignity and honor. But you know, when I read the biblical story about her life in Genesis chapter 11 and following, it was very impossible for me not to notice how she sometimes behaved. Oh, she was impatient and lacked faith in God's promise to have a child. And she took her handmaiden Hagar and she gave her to her husband to have a child. You remember that? And even though she set it all up, she didn't like it. She got hurt, became jealous, threw fits and tantrums. Oh, come on. She was impatient, temperamental, conniving, manipulative, flighty, jealous, erratic, a whiner, a complainer, and a nag. By no means, by no means was she always the perfect model of hanging on to hope and by no means was she always a woman of godliness, of grace and meekness. However, I said, however, her faith grew. I told you earlier that faith is a step-by-step, -step, moment by moment, day by day process. Her faith grew and she was able to hang on to her hope in God and she became a great woman that he used to fulfill his plan. Faith is a spiritual growth process. And my third point, we are anchored to hope through our faith. In, in Hebrews chapter six and verse, verses 19 and 20, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul that's firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain and Jesus has entered there on our behalf as a forerunner. Oh, that scripture is pregnant with a lot of me. Everyone have an anchor in their life. You have one and I have one. The question is, how well does it hold? In other words, if your soul is anchored to your money, what will you do when, it, when the money runs out? If your soul is anchored to your husband, what will you do when he is taken from you? You see, if your soul is anchored in your career, what will you do when you're fired? If your soul is anchored to, to your happiness, what will you do when hard times come? You see, if you, if you put your anchor of hope in this world, 
it will never hold because you need a place for your anchor to rest so it cannot be moved. Amen. Amen. In the, in the same way, an anchor does nothing for a boat unless it's tied to a rope. You need to be firmly attached and hanging to the anchor of hope called faith. So that no matter what happens, we have an anchor of hope that cannot be moved. One that is not of this world. One that is in heaven and is resting in the holy of holies behind the curtain in the very presence of God himself. And he's there on your behalf and he's there on my behalf as a forerunner. Oh Lord. Oh, this lesson blessed me. That, that word forerunner. It's described as a smaller boat that goes ahead of a larger ship to guide it into the harbor. And when the storm starts raging, the forerunner boat goes ahead of the larger ship and drops the anchor in the harbor for the large boat to, to, to uh, be safe during the storm. And so when the storm is passed, the ship is safe to enter the harbor. Sisters, Jesus is our forerunner. Oh, Lord, and he's leading us home to heaven. And you couldn't be safer than you already are because our hope is anchored in our faith in Jesus. Come on now. Amen. Amen. And close. Mm. God's desire for you, sisters, is to exercise your faith in him by anchoring your soul and your hope in the one that is steadfast and secure. Sarah didn't start out on her journey hanging on to hope in God. She didn't, she didn't have her soul anchored in him at first. And she didn't become a martyr of faith in God's kingdom overnight, no. But Sarah's story shows us that it does not matter who you are, where you come from, how old you are, or what your personal strengths and weaknesses are. Sarah's story shows us that God can still produce changes in your life. Amen. And just like Sarah, you have a story too. Amen. You have a story too. You may not have started it hanging on to hope. And you may not have always been the perfect model of godliness. And Lord knows there may have been some times when you felt you had nothing left. Lord, but don't let what has happened in your life, whether it's big or small, stop you from hanging on to hope in God. Because what I have learned in life is if you stop hanging on to your hope in God, you'll start hanging on to something else. Lord help us. Amen. Some of you in this event are hanging on to discouragement, to worry, and to bitterness. And it has become your default setting. And all you see is what's wrong and who hurt you, and why did they do that to me? And now that bitterness, that worry, and all that discouragement is inside of you, poisoning your soul. And you know, you may have a good reason to feel that way, but I want you to know that if you keep hanging on to those things, to bitterness, to anger, to jealousy, to, to, to backstabbing, to, to, to all of that, they will keep you from your destiny and cause you to miss out on your purpose. How long have some of us been missing out on our destiny? 50 years, 20, 70? You've been angry for so long and you, you even forgot why you're angry. Got your lips stuck out all the time like you've been sucking on persimmons. We will miss out on our destiny and our purpose if we're hanging on to the wrong things. It's time to let go of those things and grab hold on to hope. Because God did not breathe his life into you, crown you with favor, 
give you the fullness of his Godhead so that you can be hanging on to bitterness, hanging on to doubt, hanging on to worry. No, he created you to hang on to the hope in him, to, to go out each day expecting goodness, expecting nothing but good coming into your life and to know that the days ahead of you are greater than, greater than the days that you're leaving behind. Instead of being negative and whining about why is this happening to me, turn it around and exercise your faith and, 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 and turn it around for God for good. And you may not see a way out. You may not even understand what's going on. That's why you put your hope in the one that does. And when you don't see anything happening, when it's taking a long time, keep a smile on your face all throughout the day. Have the attitude of, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. I just know something good is coming my way. And I know some of you right now are thinking, but Sister Hubbard, what, what if I do that and nothing happens? What if you do that and something does happen? I'd rather go through life hanging on to my hope in God than hanging on to anger, hanging on to bitterness, hanging on to fear, hanging on to worry, because hanging on to all those things drains your spirit. You see, the enemy's job is to cause you to lose hope and give up. Yes. He, he doesn't want you to stay in the faith and go through life hanging on to your hope in God. He wants you to go around depressed and bitter and angry. But you always have a choice. A choice to focus on on the God of hope and stay in the faith or to focus on the problem and give up. Sisters, it's time you make up your mind and say, this is a new day. I've been holding on to the wrong things for too long. I'm tired of being a wishy-washy Christian. No more living in bitterness, no more being just depressed and stressed, it's time to decide that you're going to stop worrying about those things that you have no control over. Amen. Because God's got you. You have this overflowing hope poured inside of you. He is fulfilling his promise through you. And if you keep holding on to your hope in him, he will use you in miraculous ways, sisters, and fulfill his destiny through you. He will use you to influence, I don't know how many people in your lives and in your relationship for generations to come. Amen. And when you feel you have nothing left but God, remember, that you have all you need to hang on to. Say that with me, sisters. Say, when I have nothing left but God. When I have nothing. I have all I need to hang on to. Say that with confidence. When I have nothing left but God, I have all I need to hang on to. Keep hanging, sisters. Keep hanging on to your hope that you have in God. And he will use you to fulfill his purpose. Amen and amen. I turn this lesson back over to Southern Hill. All right, I need some claps out there. Thank you, Sister Hubbard, for a wonderful lesson. I tell you, so many things. You, you gave me too many things that's wrong with me, Sister Hubbard. I got, I'm looking at all these things. You know, you said hope without faith is, uh, they're inseparable. So then you're going to tell me at the end when I have nothing left but God, I have all I need. 
Thank you. That is, that is exactly right. So I got to let go of those things that I was hanging on to. I'm using it for me. I'm not going to talk about other folks just for me. And then I can stop worrying about bitterness and all the problems in our life. So we just got to listen to that lesson. I need to listen to it twice so I can do it a little better, but that was just excellent. And Sarah, First Lady mentioned in the Hall of Faith. That is fantastic. We appreciate all of that. And uh, this morning we needed that to start our weekend off so we can know that hope. We just hang it on to hope. Fantastic. So next on our program, we're going to have an excerpt from Amanda Gorman, if you guys remember, the uh, poet that was the first young poet at the presidential inauguration. We're going to play a little bit of her poem and hope you enjoy it. Then after that, we're going to have a song by Natalie Smith, and we're going to have uh, closing remarks by Harlan Terrain. Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans, and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace in the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true. That even as we grieved, we grew. That even as we hurt, we hoped. That even as we tired, we tried. That we'll forever be tied together, victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. 
In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the west. We will rise from the wind swept northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked south. We will rebuild reconcile and recover in every known nook of our nation, in every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid, the new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. We've come this far, my faith, and we're leaning on, leaning on the Lord. Oh, we're trusting, trusting in his holy word. He never failed me yet. He never failed me yet. Oh, we're singing, no. Oh, 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 I can't turn around. We've come this far by faith. We've come this far by faith, and we're leaning on, leaning on the Lord. Oh, and we're trusting, trusting in his holy word. He never failed me yet. He never failed me yet. And we're singing, oh, 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 oh. Can't turn around. We've come this far by faith. And we're singing, no, oh, 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 I can't turn around. We've come this far by faith, and we're singing, no, oh, 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 oh. Can't turn around. We've come this far by
Okay, can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Okay. Okay. Okay, can you hear me now? All right. Just check. One heck second here. I was kicked off for a minute there and I think I got double trouble. Can you hear me now? Okay, good. Okay, sister, I couldn't hear Sister Train. Could everybody else hear? Okay, can you hear us, Sister Train? You muted. Okay, well, this is technology is great. <laughs> That's all we can say. It's 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 great. So we we're finishing that. So we I didn't hear Sister Terrain, but I know it was wonderful. Whatever, however she said it. Sorry. Anyway, we're down to the end, guys, and with it's been a wonderful day. And we had decided to spend a few minutes communicating. If anyone from uh, any of our guests would wanted to wanted to make any comments. Well, I understood it. So I want to make sure it's all working before we do that. So everybody can hear me, right? Can you hear? Okay, well, great. Okay, then we will, I'm waiting for Natalie to give me the high sign to go, go ahead. Well, we want to thank Sister Hubbard and we also want to thank so much the Southern Hills Church of Christ and their leadership for allowing us to have to, to be able to participate in this program today and your ladies that were just awesome. Everything was uh, coordinated so well. Uh, we thank Sister Natalie for all that she's doing for us. So she's waving at me. She told me to wait a minute. So I'm gonna have to wait a minute for the leader. Okay, Sister Natalie, can we go forward? Thank you. We were trying to get Sister Terrain's uh, microphone working. So y'all, thank y'all for bearing with us. We were trying to make it uh, happen. So thank you. Go ahead, Sister Priscilla. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, then. So next, we were going to do our closing. I just wanted to thank everybody for, are we still opening up for comments? If that was, if uh, people want to, to talk, raise your hand or, and so that Natalie can unmute you, even use your little hand there down at the bottom where you can use that little sample and if not we can I don't oh I see Corey Walker you wanna Natalie yes is there any way you can unmute everyone and then allow uh sister terrain to do her part then at that time um yes yes okay we'll see if they can hear her um okay let's see all right, did anybody want to say anything? You guys can now unmute yourselves. If you wanted to make a quick comment, um, you are able to do so now. Yes, this is uh, Sister Corey Walker. Um, I am in Niagara Falls, New York. Uh, my husband is Herschel Walker, formerly of Boston, Massachusetts. Sister Hubbard, I just want to tell you how much I enjoyed your message very thorough and i thank you so much for the spirit that you uh in the way that you presented it this was a great ladies day i'd have to tell you ladies you did an awesome job so thank you all very much and i'm i'm hoping that we can do this again god bless
anyone else. I this is Phyllis Davis from, from, from Dallas, Texas. Hello, my international KT sisters. Hi. Hello. Hi, Sister Jackson. Hi. I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed this Ladies' Day program. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, I'm I'm just I'm just off the I'm I'm flying around in my room. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? I see more people have unmuted themselves. Anyone want to say anything? Hello, this is Sister Regina Hutchinson from Kings Kingsley Terrace. I just want to thank uh, all the speakers and uh, Southern Hill Baptist for, I mean, not sorry, Southern Hill Church of Christ for their uh, presentation. Uh, awesome lessons, awesome uh, deliverance, and just thank you everyone for having us on today. Man, guys from Toledo. Amen. Hello? 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 Oh, I did. I need to get muted my phone. All right. Sister Phyllis, we, Sister Phyllis, I can hear you. Did you want to say something? No, I was just saying hello to my KT sisters. <laughs> oh, hello, Phyllis. <laughs> hey. Okay. Hey, Phyllis. Hey, Sister Hubbard. Hey, Natalie. Joyce from girl. Toledo. Wonderful hey, program. Joyce. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining <laughs> us, Joyce. Thank you. Good so to much. see all of you. Thank you. Good to see you. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Oof. If not, we will go ahead and um, do our closing prayer. And then, ladies, at the end of the program, we'll stay on for about two minutes. So if you would like to um, put your screen on so we can see your beautiful faces, or if you would like to um, unmute yourselves so you can say hello to someone that you probably haven't seen in a while, that would be um, amazing to do. So we're super thankful. Um, and I think this is kind of what Sister Terrain was going to say, so I'm going to go ahead and say it, if that's okay. We're super thankful for the opportunity to help the Southern Hills um, Church of Christ in Dallas, Texas. Um, we were thankful for the call um, when uh, Sister Hubbard got it and asked us to jump in and help. And, and that's what it is about being sisters, being unified and showing that we're able to do so. So we're thankful for that. Um, we thank um, Brother Lane and Sister Lane both for um, giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Sister Hubbard, for that amazing um message that you gave today um truly blessed i think everyone on here if not it, it definitely blessed everyone on here so we do yeah. thank you so much for that um and then ladies we just thank all of you for being a part of um today's event um everything is really now virtual so um we at least get to see and meet people that we've never seen before or that we probably would have never met before so we're we're very thankful for the platforms such as these to do so to do so um also ladies we did record it so um this will be on uh i will make sure southern hills gets a copy of it but it will also be um on youtube um and so we will have that out for you guys soon all right um sister annette richardson if you, you can, are available. Oh, go ahead, Sister Hubbard. I'm sorry. You can go to the Kingsley Terrace site, right, Natalie? Yes. And we'll and pull it from there. It will be on there, um, preferably on, we'll say about Tuesday or Wednesday that it will be up. But uh, we will make sure you guys get the link for that. All right. Anybody All right. else? All right. Sister um, Annette Richardson, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and um, go ahead and pray us out. Okay. I think I've, am I unmuted? Yes, Anyone? Okay, wonderful. I would just like to stop to just say thank you, Southern Hill, for having us and also all of our speakers, Sister Hubbard, and we just was totally edified and built up and we just thank you. Shall we all go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Oh, gracious and loving and merciful Father, we come to you with a humbled and thankful heart, just thanking you for allowing us to see this wonderful day a day, Father, that we will never, ever, ever see again. But Father, we realize each and every day is a blessing from you. Please, Father, help us to not take one day lightly, knowing that each and every day you bless us with your love, your mercy, and your grace. And we just stop to say thank you. 
Father, we just thank you for all the sisters that presented a wonderful lesson to build us up, to strengthen us, to encourage us. And Father, let us not only just take it and not share it, Father, but let us dwell on what we've learned today. Let it meditate. Let us meditate on your word daily, Father. Draw strength from it. For we know that all our health and strength comes from you. Father, we thank you for the hope and the faith that you give us in you. You are enough. Let us never, never, never be without knowing that you are our God. You made us. You know all about us. You knew us when we were woven in our mother's womb. You know our strengths. You know our weaknesses. Father, let us never forget to hold to your unchanging hand. You're the same today, tomorrow, and forevermore. You're there for us every minute, every second of the day. Let us turn to you, Father, when things get tough for us, Father, when we just don't know which way to turn. Father, you are the one that will console our hearts and keep us on the straight and narrow each and every day. Help us to meditate on you, your word daily. And Father, we just thank you for your darling son, Jesus, for we know if it wasn't for him, where would we be? We know he's the one that gave us this opportunity to the right to the tree of life, to be able to come to you in prayer. Father, we just pray for each and every sister that is on this line. Be with us, protect and keep us each and every day. Keep us on a straight and narrow. Help us to always look up to you from whence our health and our strength come from. Let us know that you never leave us nor forsake us. Just continue to be, you'll continue to be there for us day in and day out. And Father, if we failed you in any way, rather be in word, thought, or deed, please forgive us. Lord, keep us in your care, and we will always be careful to give you the honor, all the praise, and all the glory that's due you. And it is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and thank God.